second configuration of the Russian segment after today's link-up of Prishal and the Progress Delivery Craft and what uh, the configuration will look like after uh, the Progress Craft departs on December 21st, leaving the node module in place. A spacewalk, a Russian spacewalk, uh, that is planned for about the third week in January will uh, enable uh, the node module to be integrated into the Russian segment of the International Space Station as its core's automated rendezvous system and TV cable connections will be hooked up along with docking targets and handrails uh, for future use. The first docking of a Russian vehicle to Prishal uh, is scheduled for a Soyuz uh, piloted vehicle next March. Copy. This is a view from an external camera on the uh, Progress uh, delivery craft that is attached to Prishal. This is uh, the familiar engineering crosshaired camera. There will be telemetry uh, that will be overlaid on uh, this display as uh, Prishal moves ever closer to its docking to the International Space Station. Again, uh, Prishal, Progress, and uh, the International Space Station itself with its seven crew members on board flying 260 miles over the South Pacific, about to begin a southwest to northeasterly track that will carry it across uh, Chile, across the eastern coast of South America, uh, traversing up the east coast of South America and uh, across the west coast of Africa a short time from now. The journey of Prishal, the final element uh, for the Russian segment of the International Space Station, began two days ago with its launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan on a Soyuz 2.1B rocket from Site 31 in Baikonur. The launch uh, that occurred at 7.06 a.m. Central Time, 6.06 p.m. in Baikonur, uh, resulted in an eight minute, 45 second uh, transit uh, to uh, the separation of Prishal from the third stage of the Soyuz rocket. The uh, navigational antennas and solar arrays on the Progress delivery craft were deployed right after spacecraft separation from the Soyuz booster's third stage, enabling uh, all of its systems to be checked out by the Russian flight controllers and for all of its automated engine firings to begin. That now has resulted in Prishal soon uh, to enter the neighborhood of the International Space Station. Moscow, we just lost a video image. Um, the range is 11770. Uh, range rate is 17 meters per second. Bobby, please continue. You're hearing uh, the uh, interpreted uh, conversations uh, between uh, Russian flight controllers in Karyov and the two cosmonauts on board uh, the International Space Station, Anton Shkaplerov and Pyotr Dubrov, who are inside the Zvezda service module at a workstation. They will be uh, manning uh, the controls of a joystick called the TORU system, the telerobotically operated rendezvous system, in the unlikely event uh, that the Progress's automated uh, core's rendezvous system should incur uh, a malfunction during the final phase of today's rendezvous. So far, the cores is locked on solidly with a comparable system on the International Space Station, providing updated navigational information into uh, the Progress uh, Prishal combination uh, computers, guiding it towards uh, what uh, initially will be a fly around of the station about 24 and a half minutes from now. That'll be a 54-degree fly around to precisely align the forward docking probe on Prishal to the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory Module Docking Port uh, for final approach and ultimately contact and capture with docking scheduled at 9.26 a.m. Central Time, 10.26 a.m. Eastern Time. The docking port to which Prishal is arriving uh, in just uh, 48 minutes from now was cleared yesterday on Thanksgiving morning when the unpiloted 78 uh, Progress cargo craft detached, 
undocked from the, the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module and backed away. This is a, a replay of yesterday's undocking of the 78 Progress cargo craft. It uh, undocked at 5.23 a.m. Central Time, 6.23 a.m. Eastern Time, backed away to a safe distance away from the International Space Station, from which uh, Russian flight controllers then sent commands to deorbit that vehicle loaded with trash, where it uh, fell back into the Earth's atmosphere and burned up harmlessly over the Pacific Ocean. The detachment of the 78 Progress craft cleared the way again for the Nader or Earth-facing port on the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module to greet the new Prishal uh, node module with that docking schedule just under 47 minutes from now. Moscow Station uh, range is nine kilometers. Um, I go to activate VHF-2. You are? The uh, report uh, from the Russian Control Center is that Prishal is now about nine kilometers away from the International Space Station, closing at a normal rate uh, towards uh, its initial fly around of the station and uh, a very, very brief period of station keeping in which uh, the uh, node module will basically, the progress delivery craft attached to Prishal will put the brakes on for a period of station keeping that will enable Russian flight controllers to assess the alignment of the forward docking probe on Prishal toward the uh, Naoka multipurpose laboratory module before the final command is sent for the final approach and link up of Prishal to Naoka. On board the International Space Station, the seven crew members, as mentioned before, uh, from left to right, uh, NASA astronauts uh, Raja Chari and Tom Marshburn, European Space Agency astronaut Matthias Maurer, uh, cosmonauts uh, Anton Shkaplerov, who was the station commander, along with Pyotr Dubrov, and second from the right, Kayla Barron, and on the far right, NASA's Mark Van de Heij. They're up and around. Uh, they're conducting other business uh, outside of Shkaplerov and Dubrov, who, as I mentioned a moment ago, are inside the Zvezda service module, uh, monitoring the approach of Prishal at the ready uh, to take over manual control in the unlikely event an issue would occur with the Corps' automated rendezvous system. Uh, Marshburn, Barron, and Van de Heij and later today, along with Matthias Moore, will be conducting a uh, spacewalk procedure conference with flight controllers here in Houston in advance of uh, next Tuesday's spacewalk by Tom Marshburn and Caleb Barron that will begin at 6.10 a.m. Central Time, 7.10 a.m. Eastern Time to replace a faulty S-band communications antenna system on the Port 1 truss of the International Space Station. We'll talk more about that later in the broadcast. This view now of the engineering data on the external camera of the progress delivery craft attached to Prishal, showing in the far, uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, the uh, distance between uh, Prishal and Progress and the International Space Station, now just over seven kilometers separating uh, the uh, arriving Prishal module and the station, closing at a rate of just under 10 meters per second. TV burn is complete. Um, copy that. Now for Piotr, Piotr, you can activate recording um, since uh, we're already getting a video image from both MLM and Progress. So um, this is a perfect time to uh, press recording and start recording the entire um, sequence. Copy. Starting recording in work. Again, uh, Russian flight controllers, uh, you're hearing the interpretation of their conversations with Russian cosmonauts Anton Shkaplerov and Pyotr Dubrov uh, on board the International Space Station, actively monitoring the approach of uh, Prishal to the complex. You just saw an external uh, HD camera view from International Space Station cameras as the station approaches uh, the coast of Chile and the Andes Mountains, moving from southwest to northeast. Um, and uh, the uh, recording field is showing that recording is in progress, and um, the uh, time is incrementing. 
copy, Peter. Thank you very much. In just a few minutes, uh, there will be a test of the command link uh, from Shkaplerov and Dubrov of the uh, telerobotically operated rendezvous system uh, as they uh, send uh, test signals basically uh, to uh, the onboard systems of the uh, Prushal node module and the progress delivery craft that is attached to Prushal. This will verify uh, that we have a good backup rendezvous system in the event uh, a problem would occur with the CORE's automated rendezvous system. So far, CORE's is operating solidly, providing all of the updated navigational information to the Progress's onboard computers. You can see uh, traversing uh, the river uh, along Chile's mountains, that uh, white dot you see, that is the uh, Prashal module and the Progress resupply or delivery craft in this case. As uh, Prashal and Progress approach uh, the five kilometer mark away from the International Space Station. Prishal in progress now crossing the pampas of uh, Argentina. We'll pass just to the west of Buenos Aires on this pass. A good view of the uh, progress delivery craft in the uh, Prashal node module flying over Argentina. Moving uh, inexorably towards its docking to the International Space Station less than 40 minutes from now. There will be a, a series of so-called impulse burns. Those are small engine firings on the progress delivery craft. It essentially uh, is a propulsion module for the Prashal node. Those uh, impulse burns are uh, small engine firings to fine tune the vehicle's path to the International Space Station. We're about 15 minutes away from uh, the new Prashal entering the neighborhood of the International Space Station for its fly around and its alignment to the nadir or earth facing port of the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module.
Prichal in progress uh, now crossing the border between Argentina and Uruguay. And there's our first view of the International Space Station from external cameras on Prichal in progress. Now three kilometers uh, separating uh, the new module from its final destination, closing at a rate of eight meters per second. Prichal in progress and now have moved uh, across Uruguay, now flying 260 miles over southern Brazil. Range rate uh, and rotation started. And a good view of the new uh, Prisal node module and the attached uh, progress instrumentation and propulsion compartment. The uh, new module right on course for a docking schedule 35 minutes from now. Again, uh, the node module consists of six docking ports, one of which will be employed uh, to link up to the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module, five radial ports, will then be available to accommodate uh, future unpiloted progress resupply vehicles and piloted Soyuz spacecraft. Copy. We have uh, rotation in reverse and a five, uh, uh, decimal five, five range is two kilometers. We're watching uh, the reverse maneuver. Uh, range four, uh, decimal, uh, range rate four, decimal 23, uh, range rate one, decimal 76. Uh, we give you a go to activate. Okay, standing by. Uh, to activate Toro. Uh, Anton, we give you a go to activate Toro. Copy you, uh, your go to activate Toro. We're activating Toro. Majestically framed against the limb of the Earth, the uh, Prichal node module and the progress instrumentation and propulsion compartment flying uh, just uh, to the northwest of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we're ex performing tour tests. Uh, One and a half kilometers separating uh, Prichal from the International Space Station, closing at a rate of four meters per second about eight and a half minutes from uh, beginning its fly around of the complex, 
that you see in this view from the external camera on progress, closing in uh, right on course and right on track for its docking. We release the push button. I am activating the network. Uh, we uh, have the power network of the hand controllers uh, activating WebAS input initial. Uh, activating WebAS uh, initial. We have internal power on. Copy. I am preparing the hand controllers. Yes, uh, start the test, uh, the hand controller test. Uh, the hand controllers are on. Uh, we are starting hand controller uh, test uh, for attitude, uh, moving hand controller up. We see all four eliminated. Neutral. No longer eliminated. Uh, motion down. Four LEDs are eliminated. Uh, neutral position, uh, no longer eliminated, moving to the left. Four Russian flight controllers continuing uh, to provide situational awareness for Anton Kaplarov, the ISS commander, and his uh, fellow Russian cosmonaut, uh, Pyotr Dubrov, inside the Zvezda service module. They've just conducted a test of the telerobotically operated rendezvous system, a backup system to the Corps' automated rendezvous system, that is currently guiding uh, Prishal in progress toward the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module. Here in Mission Control in Houston, Flight Director Rick Henfling shortly will uh, conduct a poll of his flight controllers to get a go no go for final approach and docking. He then will relay that to his uh, Russian shift flight controller, our uh, flight director counterpart at the Russian Mission Control Center outside of Moscow. Down. Internal and external are on neutral position, no longer eliminated, to the left. External and internal are on neutral position, no longer eliminated. Uh, to the right, external and internal are on. Uh, the switch, pulling the uh, switch down. Internal and external are on, released, no longer eliminated. Pushing it away from myself. Uh, internal and external are on. Neutral position no longer eliminated. The solid hand controller test is without issues. Copy. Thank you. So the reports are all good. Uh, all of Prishal's systems, all of Progress's systems in perfect shape so far. We're now uh, 800 meters separating the new module from the International Space Station, closing at a rate of two meters per second. Okay, copy. No longer eliminated. Copy, Anton, uh, work for item 12.3, uh, starting on item 12.3. BPS in the initial uh, position, activating operation. Turned on the uh, operation. Alpha. And Flight Director Rick Henfling has completed his poll of flight controllers. All positions here are go for docking. The International Space Station in Prishal now uh, flying 260 miles just off the northeast coast of South America. Anton, uh, you can set the video that is uh, comfortable for you. I have uh, access to. I have set up the comfortable position. 
Okay, copy. I have turned off the operation, and now the four LEDs are not on. Copy. I am going to go to page 92 and continue the approach. Range speaking simultaneously. One range rate, one five five. Copy. Of work for page 92 from the start of the fly around. Copy. I am on page 92. And as you heard, uh, everything is all set for the beginning of the 54 degree fly around of uh, Prishal in progress to align uh, the new module with the. Uh, Nader docking port, the earth-facing docking port of the Naoka multi-purpose laboratory module. The reports are at uh, the 500 meter mark uh, separating uh, Prishal and the International Space Station, all systems are in perfect shape. Range rate is 450. Copy. Range is 400. Uh, the power activation confirmed. We confirm fly around. Copy. Uh, and uh, the report uh, right on target. Uh, the fly around of uh, Prishal in progress of the International Space Station now underway. 365 meters separating the new module from the International Space Station. And again, you can see the fly around uh, as it is being conducted from the external engineering camera on the progress delivery craft. Range uh, is 300 meters, range rate one uh, decibel 38. Exactly uh, where Prishal and Progress are supposed to be at this point of the fly around, which should be completed shortly at a distance of about uh, 200 meters, at which point there'll be a brief period of station keeping. Uh, visually and uh, verify the course uh, readings using the scale. Uh, okay, it's about one and a half uh, squares is the range. Okay, copy. Well, it's slightly bigger than one uh, square. It's about uh, one uh, decimal two squares uh, per scale. Okay, copy that it matches.
approaching uh, the west coast of Africa now. Two hundred forty meters separating uh, Prishal and Progress from the International Space Station's Naoka module, closing at a rate of two tenths of a meter per second. Uh, the um, docking module is slightly uh, bigger than one. Where? Copy. Anton, okay. okay, go ahead on DAFCON. Uh, before I'm station keeping, Anton. Okay, in 17 minutes, copy. The docking module is within one degree. Copy. I am uh, watching the uh, maneuver, the roll maneuver. Copy. This roll maneuver uh, now underway uh, will properly align the solar arrays on the progress instrumentation and propulsion compartment into the right orientation for final approach, contact, and capture. 200 meters separating Prishal from Naoka. Crossing the border now between Mauritania and Morocco. Range is 190. Uh, your is about zero. Uh, watching uh, the roll uh, maneuver. Copy. Anton. Uh, send the command BPS initial from the uh, display for, for and operation. Sending command BPS initial. Uh, for LEDs are on, and uh, now they're no longer illuminated. I see operation. Four are on. This is Mission Control Houston, a great view of the node module, the Prishal the brand new uh, module and the final element of the Russian segment of the International Space Station. The uh, Russian flight controllers wasted little time uh, giving a go for final approach after just a few seconds of station keeping. So we're in the final phase of uh, this rendezvous with docking scheduled about 17 minutes from now. Four LED are no longer, LEDs are no longer eliminated. Copy. Uh, Work for uh, page 93, monitoring automatic approach. A copy working for page 
The target is uh, toward, bo toward bottom right, uh, within two degrees. Uh, range uh, rate is 160, and range rate is uh, negative uh, 0 0.8. I confirm uh, that the dimensions are aligned and the um, uh, range is about 150. Copy. Coming up on the 100-meter mark separating uh, Prishal and Naoka, you can see the uh, circular docking port of uh, the multipurpose laboratory module just uh, below the crosshairs in this external engineering camera on the progress delivery craft. Closing at a rate of about six-tenths of a meter per second now. Flying just to the south of Casablanca. Um, uh, the range is uh, showing 100 meters. Copy, range is 100 meters. Target is, uh, is uh, toward the bottom by two degrees, and crosshairs are aligned. Copy. Ten minutes until eclipse, uh, the headlight is on. Copy. Copy, the headlight is on. SM is uh, showing ranges about 75, 75. Uh, uh, range rate is 033. The target is the same towards the bottom by two degrees, and crosshairs are aligned. Copy. Sixty-five meters now separating Prishal, uh, this great view of the new node module and the attached progress delivery craft. As uh, the combination uh, sails 263 statute miles off the northern coast of Africa over the Mediterranean. MCC Moscow, the range is about 40 meters uh, per the measurement, it's 46 per course measurement. Uh, range is zero, 0 0.17 and the target is toward the bottom by two degrees. Do you see the video? Yes, I see the video. We, we have, we see the video. We see the message uh, that is SFP is ready. Forward docking probe on uh, Prishal has been extended. Uh, the docking system is now active, some 12 minutes away from contact and capture.
Anton at range 30. Uh, at three, 30 meter range, do not send command over car antenna is retracted. Okay, copy. Our range is about 30 meters. I am turning uh, off BPS initial operation. Copy. Flying just north of Rome and soon to enter an orbital sunset, the uh, node module now just 30 meters away from its final port of call. Yes, uh, the target is toward the bottom uh, by about two degrees. Uh, the crosshairs are aligned. Copy. Speaking simultaneously. Our range is about 20 to zero. Copy. Continue. We can uh, con continue monitoring the automatic approach. We see uh, some uh, interferences in the video, uh, and now it, the video is restored. Copy. Uh, five minutes until eclipse. One cell on the target. Uh, about 18 meter range. Okay, we see a little bit of a roll. We see. Uh, the target toward the bottom within two degrees. Copy. All of those reports uh, to Anton Shkaplerov and Pyotr Dubrov on the International Space Station indicating uh, a perfect alignment of the uh, Prishal's uh, forward docking probe that you can see in this view as it uh, is about to pass behind uh, the solar array on a Soyuz uh, vehicle that is docked uh, nearby. Uh, the role at the uh, Rosviet module of the International Space Station. Now 15 meters separating Prishal from Nayuka, closing at a rate of one tenth of a meter per second. I, I work, I'm working with AGC mode. I see crosshairs are being misaligned. I see the target. Uh, the role is about 30, 30 degrees. Copy. About two cells. The range is about eight meters. The target is to the left uh, by about th uh, three degrees. Copy. Uh, the misalignment is increasing. Three degrees to the left. We're going with the uh, roll bias of 30. Uh, two and a half cells. The range is about six meters. Copy. I'll continue monitoring the automatic approach until it, uh, it's more by the misalignment. It's uh, more than four cells. Okay. Six meters away now. Three degrees to the. Um, Left and bottom now about two degrees. Core's final alignment uh, is taking over. Standing by for contact and capture. About one meter. Three degrees to the left to the bottom. Uh, to the bottom one degree. We, we have contact. Contact confirmed. And capture confirmed at 9.19 a.m. Central Time, 10.19 a.m. Eastern Time, as Prishal and the International Space Station flew 262 miles over Ukraine. 
So a holiday season delivery of a new module to complete the Russian segment of the International Space Station, now complete. The docking probe now retracting. This will pull the two docking interfaces flush against one another to enable the initiation of the closing of hooks and latches. Copy. Once again, uh, the new module, the node module, a multi-port uh, docking venue for future progress resupply craft and piloted Soyuz vehicles. Now part of the International Space Station, you can see it there, docked to the Earth-facing port of the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module, having been delivered by the Progress Instrumentation and Propulsion module that is attached to Prishal and which will undock on December 21st to be deorbited to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, leaving the node module, of course, as a permanent fixture on the International Space Station. Docking occurring once again at 9.19 a.m. Central Time, 10.19 a.m. Eastern Time, as Prishal and the International Space Station flew over Ukraine. The uh, hooks on the Prashal module now in the process of closing to form a hard mate between the newly arrived module and Naoka.
This is Mission Control Houston. Hooks are now closed, forming a hard mate between the new Prishal module, the Russian word for pier, the new multi-port docking venue for multiple uh, Progress and Soyuz vehicles of the future. Prishal arriving at the International Space Station about six minutes ago at 9.19 a.m. Central Time, 10.19 a.m. Eastern Time, linking up to the Earth-facing port of the uh, Neuka Multipurpose Laboratory Module, having been uh, delivered uh, to the station by a modified progress instrumentation and propulsion craft that will separate from Prishal on December 21st, leaving the node module as a permanent fixture to the Russian segment of the International Space Station. It was as flawless a rendezvous as you can uh, have. No issues from the time of its launch two days ago from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, arriving uh, flawlessly after an uneventful uh, journey on the 34 orbits from the launch pad in Baikonur to the International Space Station. This uh, newly arrived node module, the Prashal, will be uh, integrated into the Russian segment of the station during a Russian spacewalk by Anton Shkaplerov and Pyotr Dubrov on January 19th, when uh, they will spend about six and a half hours outside hooking up uh, the CORE's automated rendezvous uh, connections and television cable connections, also will install docking targets and handrails and remove uh, other antennas that will be jettisoned, no longer needed now that Prishal is attached to the International Space Station. I wanted to check, do I execute item 11 only or do I need to do item 10 as well? So with uh, Prishal having uh, flawlessly and successfully docked uh, to the Naoka module of the International Space Station, there's more activity on tap next week at the International Outpost. Uh, let's take a quick look. Next up, uh, a spacewalk by NASA astronauts Tom Marshburn and Kayla Barron to uh, replace a faulty S-band communications antenna on the Port 1 truss of the International Space Station. We will preview that spacewalk, U.S. Spacewalk number 78, in a briefing here at the Johnson Space Center next Monday at 1 p.m. Central Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time on NASA television. The spacewalk itself is scheduled uh, for Tuesday, November 30th, a planned six and a half hour excursion out of the Quest airlock of the International Space Station by Marshburn and Barron that will begin our coverage will begin at 4.30 a.m. Central, 5.30 a.m. Eastern Time with the spacewalk itself to get underway at about 6.10 Central Time, 7.10 a.m. Eastern Time. So with that, uh, we'll wrap up our coverage for today. The Prashal node module now hard mated to the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module after a perfect two-day rendezvous following its launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. With that, uh, we'll uh, conclude for the day. We hope you have a great uh, rest of the holiday weekend, and we'll see you back here next week for spacewalk coverage. This is Mission Control Houston.
And we're back with more Black Hole Friday. I am your host, Scott Bednar. Okay, so let's get sucked up into black holes. Not literally, of course, because we would die. Figuratively, we're going to discuss what black holes are, how they work, why they exist. I mean, have you ever wondered what would happen if you fell into a black hole? Have a nice trip, see you next never. We've got black hole experts lined up for you, and we'll even take you on a tour of a telescope that flies the friendly skies. But before we take off, please be seated, fasten your seatbelts, and take note of the nearest exits as you give your attention to this short black hole safety video. So you want to visit a black hole. You've packed your bags, you've updated your passport, and you're basically ready to jump on a spaceship and blast off. However, before you do that, I have just one piece of advice. Don't. Okay? If you really must go, I suppose you should at least know a few things about black holes before you leave. First, you should know exactly what a black hole is. A black hole is a physical object in space, just like everything else. It's made up of a tiny but massive point where gravity and density are infinite, a line beyond which everything, including light, can only fall into that tiny point, and sometimes some glowing stuff orbiting around it, and maybe some radiation. So basically, here is kind of bad, here is really bad, and here is safe. Also, black holes mostly come in two sizes. Don't ask me why, we still aren't sure. However, a black hole is also not a lot of things. It is not a hole, a cosmic vacuum theater, a portal to another dimension populated by unicorns and space potatoes, and absolutely not a good place to vacation. Okay, fine. I guess next you'll need to know how to find a black hole. Though technically black holes could just sneak up behind you, they likely won't. The nearest known one is 3,000 light years away anyway. However, if you were to go looking for one, there are a couple of good ways to find them. First, black holes tend to mess with their environment, so you can sometimes use interesting clues, such as a bunch of stuff orbiting what appears to be nothing. And second, as we mentioned before, there's often glowing stuff orbiting around them, caused by, well, when things get too close. So now that you've found a black hole and clearly aren't listening to me saying not to go, it's time for a few important safety considerations. First of all, the good news is that as long as you stay far away, black holes aren't all that bad. However, as you get closer, you need to keep a few things in mind. The radiation near the black hole can be extremely deadly, the chances of escape get slimmer the closer you get, and if you get close enough, you now have to worry about being stretched into a giant noodle and time getting really weird. So, unless you have great radiation shields, a faster than light spaceship, or you're completely indestructible, you should probably just stay away. Well, that pretty much sums up black holes, at least before things start getting really complicated. But before you go for real, please refer to the handy brochure in your spacesuit pocket, since there's quite a bit to remember. Now then, remember your tickets, enjoy your trip, and please, be careful. Did you know? A black hole is a single point in space that has a lot of mass. One of the ways that we look for black holes is to develop new instruments and new technologies that can try to search for them. As we've observed black holes, um, including the, the supermassive black hole uh, in the center of our galaxy, um, because it has such a strong gravity, because it has lots of mass, uh, stars will orbit black holes. And as stars get closer and closer to the center of the black hole, as it crosses over the event horizon, um, what will happen is that the material of these stars will get shredded apart because the gravitational pull of a black hole is so strong that the material of the stars gets pulled apart. 
But there is an event horizon, which is the point at which the black hole's gravity starts to, to pull you so much that you can't escape. So as you approach the black hole, you'll feel its pull, but then as you get closer and closer and closer towards the event horizon, that's the point of no return, so you couldn't escape past that. The, the easiest way to think of a black hole is just like anything that has mass. So the Earth has mass. And one of the reasons that the moon orbits around the Earth is because the gravitational attraction of these two massive bodies. Um, and so Earth is distorting the space around the moon. And so that's what keeps the moon in orbit. And so now take that to an extreme. So take something that's as massive as the sun or as massive as a million suns and put it at a single point. And that distortion that you get is coming from that amount of mass in a single point. Black holes vary in size a lot. We know that black holes can be formed by massive stars exploding and then collapsing into the singular point. And those give us black holes that are about the mass of the sun. So those are solar mass black holes. However, we also know at the center of galaxies like the Milky Way, there are supermassive black holes. And these are millions or even billions of times the mass of the sun. And how these form is actually a mystery. Studying black holes um, really gives us a fundamental insight into how gravity works because it's such a small physical scale, but it's a super massive object. And so understanding how black holes work and the interactions of black holes in, in other parts of the universe really give us a fundamental insight that we could then use to think about how our own solar system works. And so if we can understand how black holes work, it'll give us a key to really understanding our universe. Check out this Hubble image of a galaxy 8 billion light years away. Notice anything unusual about it? This super bright spot is not a star in the foreground blocking our view, but is actually a quasar named 3C186 that's inside the pictured galaxy. A quasar is the extremely bright light that's emitted by hot gas surrounding a supermassive black hole. A supermassive black hole is a type of black hole that's at least 100,000 times more massive than our sun and is at the center of almost every massive galaxy. But the center of this galaxy is over here, in this green circle. This galaxy's quasar, and therefore its supermassive black hole, for some reason is more than 35,000 light years away from the galaxy's center. And the redshift, a spectral signature of the gas in the quasar, shows that the black hole is flying away from the center at over 1,300 miles per second. For reference, our sun is moving through our galaxy at about 15 miles per second. This particular black hole is over 1 billion times more massive than our sun. What could have possibly moved something so enormous? A team of astronomers led by Marco Chiaberge at the Space Telescope Science Institute think that they've found the most plausible explanation. Taking a look at the Hubble image, there's some faint material surrounding the galaxy called tidal tails, and these are produced by a gravitational tug between two or more colliding galaxies. If this galaxy is actually two galaxies that merged, then it's possible their two central supermassive black holes also merged. As enormous objects like supermassive black holes are merging, they create ripples in the fabric of space-time called gravitational waves. The two black holes whirl around each other, getting closer and closer, and fling out gravitational waves like water from a lawn sprinkler. If the two black holes are a bit uneven, maybe one's more massive, maybe one's rotating a little bit faster, then they fling out these gravitational waves more strongly along one direction. Once the two black holes finally collide, the newly merged black hole shoots off in the opposite direction from the strongest gravitational waves, and that's what astronomers think happened to this supermassive black hole. Based on its enormous mass and velocity, the energy needed to jettison this black hole was equivalent to something like 100 million supernovas exploding simultaneously. So while this may not go on your list of the top prettiest Hubble images, just think. 
You are looking at the light emitted 8 billion years ago from gas orbiting a 1 billion solar mass black hole that is flying through its galaxy because it was shot off like a rocket from the gravitational waves produced by the merging of two supermassive black holes. And if that's not cool, I don't know what is. Okay, let's dive right into black holes. Again, not literally. I am joined by two NASA scientists, Bernard and Shabashish. Thank you both so much for being here today. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Thank All you. right, let's get started. So I feel like a TV show about black holes would not be complete without asking, what is a black hole? That's a big question, Scott. <laughs> yeah, so black holes are just like any other massive object in the universe. It's just that the mass is so much condensed into a small volume that the space time around it is, it is warped so much that not even light photons can come out of it. So to imagine if sun is compressed, the same mass of the sun is compressed to a, to a volume of three kilometer radius, it would become a vol uh, b black hole. And if the earth is compressed to this volume, it will become a black hole. And not even light photons could come out of it. But the gravitational effect around it would be the same. So astrophysically, black hole is usually the endpoint of, say, a dead star. After it's used up all its fuel, it gets compressed down to a tiny, tiny space. So I understand you have a demonstration set up over here that can help us better understand black holes. We have a lot to unpack. So you want to show it to us? Sure. Okay. So this here is what we call our spandex spacetime. It's a way we visualize how gravity works, according to Albert Einstein. And so before Einstein, we thought gravity was just like a force between two massive objects like stars or planets or whatever. And it was very strong because they were quite close together and because they were so massive and it was direct interaction. Einstein said that wasn't quite right. So really what you should think about is space itself playing this central role. So instead of space just being kind of unchanging, space is kind of warpable, it's deformable. You can actually bend it and it has an effect. So if you took, say, a small star just traveling through space on its own, not near anything else, it would just go in a straight line, just through space. But if for some reason there's something very massive nearby, some very dense object like a black hole, sitting in space, what it does is it warps the space, it bends it. Now any object trying to move in a straight line can't move in a straight line anymore. It's going as straight as it can, but it looks like a curve, just like that. And if the object is kind of very lucky, it can get caught in an orbit just by having an orbit or a path that's continuously curved around the central object. And that, in fact, is how our own solar system works. Our planets orbit around the sun because they feel the slight curvature that the sun makes around it. And that's how gravity works. That is gravity. And it has some interesting side effects. So not just planets and small objects, but even light itself can be affected. So if I had a very distant object in the universe, say a quasar, some very, very bright, very distant object, 
and I'm trying to look straight at it, but there's something like a black hole or some other dense object in between, the light straight from the quasar doesn't come to me. It, gets, uh, it hits the black hole and it's absorbed, but the light that would otherwise go just past me to my right or to my left is actually bent in back toward me. So instead of seeing one image, I see a few images or even a whole smeared out ring of images of this one thing. And this is something we call gravitational lensing. So this is really helping put things in perspective. So the, the, this is showing how black holes interact with their surroundings. And that's how we know they exist, even though we can't see them. So, so that's one way we have of knowing they exist. Another way, kind of related, is if instead of this black hole being far away from other things, if it's part of a binary star system, its companion, with, which might be a normal star, it's not as compressed as a black hole. And as it orbits around the black hole, bits of its outer layer can be, uh, can be ripped away. And they can end up orbiting the black hole itself in a kind of a disk of gas, hot gas that gets very, very hot and glows very, very brightly. And that's also something that we can see. Now that you've learned about the basic solitary black hole, let's start talking about some fancier ones. While black holes themselves are indeed black, they can also be a bright source of light, putting on a great show of things like gas, dust, snacks, potatoes, missing left socks, or even stars get a bit too close. Often, this stuff can turn into an accretion disk, which is basically a bunch of gas, dust, and uh, other stuff circling the black hole in, well, a disk. Anyway, as everything spirals in, it gets super hot and causes the wonderful spectacle we see here. Black holes can also show off by launching powerful jets, which are made when some of the stuff falls toward the black hole, gets sped up to nearly the speed of light, and then gets thrown off at also nearly the speed of light. Some of this stuff, in the form of light and charged particles, can even make it all the way to planets like Earth. The most amazing thing about all this though, is that it could actually appear as many kinds of brilliant, bright light, including lots of light we can't see with our eyes. So, if you really want to see a fancy black hole in all its glory, it could help to have a lot of different telescopes that can see all the fanciness. And now that you know this, grab as many telescopes as you can find, line them all up, and enjoy. Now, while a lot of smaller black holes enjoy spending time by themselves, others can be a bit more social. To be specific, black holes often love to dance with other objects in the universe. Sometimes the dance begins with two stars, long before the black hole is even part of the picture. Then, one day, one of the two stars goes supernova and pop! The dance continues, but with a new partner. Other times, when another massive object, like a star, happens to pass by a black hole, it and the black hole can't help but dance together. In either case, the black hole could even pull stuff off of its new friend to make a fancy accretion disk. Look at it go! And while these first two black holes have been paired up with stars, there are